Guys, I think at this point it wouldn't be a DAS conference without the two of you closing down the main stage. This is a nice tradition. Glad we're doing this again. Um, can we, uh, before we get into it, can we just do a super quick round of intros? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves and what you're doing in crypto. So, uh, Danny Masters, I am the founder and chairman of an organization called CoinShares International. Uh, we manage today around six and a half billion dollars across 20 some products ranging from listed exchange traded notes, exchange traded funds, equity products, private equity funds, trading funds. Uh, we also do some market making and liquidity provision, and we have a, a good sized private equity portfolio focused in crypto infrastructure. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so John Cheeseman, um, I'm a partner at Room 40 Capital, which is a multi-strat uh, liquid hedge fund in crypto. Um, we've got about uh, just over $100 million in, in capital, um, actually just launched in, in March. So yeah, so good start. Excellent, guys. I'm really excited. I think maybe a good way to divide this talk would actually be the title of this talk is The Past, Present, and Future of Crypto. So why don't we start with the past? And Danny, maybe I'll call on you so you're the OG uh, of the three of us on this stage. But before you were the head of this $7 billion behemoth that is CoinShares, um, you're doing a little bit of cowboying back in the day in 2012 when you first got into crypto. So can you tell us a little bit about what it was like getting back in there in the early days? What made you see Bitcoin just so much earlier than everyone else? Um, well, part of it was lack of other things to do, I think, at the time. But, um, <laughs> I, I'd run a commodity business for about a dozen years Uh uh, as a hedge fund coming out of JP Morgan, where I ran uh, the global energy business. And um, the truth is that I was sitting in my office one day with the sound off on the television and a chart came up of an unknown asset. Uh, and having looked at a lot of commodity charts over a long period of time, I recognized that there was a lot of energy contained within this price action. And I, I mean, it was like at $5 or $10 at the time. So I sent 10,000 bucks of my own money to a Chinese agricultural bank that I still can't recall the name of. And I got a credit on a little known exchange called Mt. Gox. Um, and I shipped off my Bitcoin. I put them in what was then called an armory wallet. I'm not sure they even have those anymore. And I began to sort of play around, send it to and from wallets. That was kind of fun. Then I did a deep dive on the technology. I locked myself away for a couple of days and I hand solved a block, which required doing some two, 256, SHA-256 code cracking and some Merkle trees and some block headers and you know doing what a miner does uh, by hand over a, a couple of day period. And I began to realize what an elegant technical structure it was. And I was almost there. And, and now I met Wences Cesaris. And Wences gave me a lecture on what money was. And I realized that this was a really elegant new form of money. And that was the beginning of our journey. Yeah, you know, one of the things I like, I think both of you uh, talk about digital assets like this actually is you look at it from the lens of a uh, commodity trader. And, you know, we've had a couple of panels today. We've talked about there's sort of a money angle on this that you could understand crypto or digital assets. You could understand it from the standpoint of a business. Uh, we've had various panels talking about almost like doing DCFs on the revenue that some of these protocols generate. I feel like when we have conversations, the two of you guys sort of talk about this from the perspective of a commodity. Um, can you say more about about that kind of angle for looking at digital assets? I mean, I think, I think we're still in, you know, we're still in the kind of early stages of digital asset, the, the proliferation of digital assets. Now, so supply and demand, you know, is I think the fundamental driver at the moment of Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think we're right in the transition now to technology becoming a bigger driver. Um, you know, we're seeing much more use cases, the, the scalability of, you know, Ethereum blockchain, the scalability of Solana blockchain is, is growing. And I think we're now getting to the point where we're going to transition from being commodity investors to, to technology investors. And I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a really exciting time. Well, I'd make two observations on that one. You know, I've been involved in lots of asset classes. Certainly when I was at JP Morgan, I had exposure to pretty much all financial asset classes and, where crypto is unique is it does have multiple sort of faces to different people and multiple geographies. And there really isn't another asset class in the world that can appeal in different ways to people from pretty much every jurisdiction. So it's an incredibly global asset. I mean, almost as much as a dollar in many ways and, and more, more interesting. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing in terms of the relation to the commodities market, something very interesting happened in the commodities market over a long period of time. And when I started in the eighties, um, 
it was an industrial logistics business. You know, we moved ships of oil and products around the world. And it stayed that way until about 2000. And by 2000, um, it had become very active and very liquid, but there weren't any, I would call real world players. There wasn't really access for third party investors. There wasn't any listed products. Uh, there wasn't much of a discussion, a narrative in the media about what commodities really meant. And then Goldman Sachs invented the GSCI, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, and it absolutely transformed the way the commodity markets functioned. Uh, and, and over the period from sort of 2000 to 2005, about $400 billion flowed into commodities through that one instrument. And it sort of resonates with me with what's going on with the US ETFs right now. And I think it brings in, and soon we'll have options, and then we'll have repos, and then we'll have all these other things, and other, probably other, uh, other coins as well, and baskets and so on. And it, 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 you know, the GSCI legitimized commodities and allowed people to interact with them in a way that even though they've existed for quite some time uh, and were already big and liquid, that it really transformed the pricing and it transformed the product mix and the sort of the uh, diversity of products available. And I feel that we've just crossed that border now. And I, I think the interesting part about that is, you know, the most important thing for me about, about the ETF is, is the legitimizing process that, that that we're going through at the moment uh you know the second most important part is how powerful it is as a rail for access which was exactly what the gsei commodity index was but you know one of the most important things that happened in that big commodity bull market was you know an explosion in growth in china but it was the rail that the gsei provided that basically that 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 you know that allowed that move to be catalyzed with huge price appreciation now so Looking forward, if you think about the macro catalyst that we're seeing at the moment, which is, you know, ongoing supply of, of, of fiat money, um, I, you know, I'd imagine that coupled with, um, you know, trust in, in, in centralized institutions versus, you know, a credible alternative now is the kind of the, the macro thesis that will allow, that will really create the move that's enabled by this, the, these new rails. Mm. Yeah, I, you know, just to maybe underline and draw the comparison to the audience, make sure if I'm understanding the two of you is that, you know, commodities, it used to be primarily for actually corporates that wanted to use commodities in their business, Absolutely. right? And then it's sort of what I'm hearing in around 2000, it underwent this financialization, right? There was kind of an underlying real fundamental driver, which was China, but then it underwent this financialization through this new Goldman Sachs index. And I feel like there is an analogy to, Bitcoin um, and digital and digital assets today, where there's this real underlying driver, which is currency debasement for the most part. And now what we're seeing is increased financialization around the ETFs and allowing new groups of capital to gain access to it. Does that sound about right? Spot on. Well, you know, the, the largest pools of money in the world, they, they try and, you know, create an index of, of, of real world assets. And the ETF will, you know, just as the GSCI allowed commodities to be put in that index of like, I suppose, like a risk parity index, you can now put crypto in there too. And that's, you know, and, and the, the other thing I think that's really important is, you know, the types of investors that, that will now be buying crypto assets, they're not looking to sell, they're indexing. That is, you know, they want a permanent, you know, that, that, that allocation may move, but they want an allocation. And the allocation before was, you know, was, was, was zero. So, and, and then, and then the next thing you'll see as well is when, there's a more liquid options market. Um, you know that 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 creates a lot of structured products, and you know usually de decreases volatility, but it also draws a lot of assets into the. And I, I think you know to delve a little deeper on the point you make about indexation, um, the purpose of people running real world asset indices is they're indexing to store value and to let their assets you know maintain purchasing power over time. So when you talk about the characteristics of money, you know, it almost now you're bordering not just on the store of value, you're bordering on the unit of account because that index is in itself some form of hybrid currency. Um, and that is a unit of account. So that's kind of how you're backdooring, I think, into uh, all the qualities of money that uh, we've always said that Bitcoin will eventually uh, acquire. Hello, hello, listeners of On The Margin. I've got good news for those of you who are in the crypto scene. Blockworks is bringing back Permissionless. We're going to be doing Permissionless 3, and this year we are heading west. So we're moving that out to Salt Lake City. That's going to be October 9th through 11th this year. We've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers for you. So we've got Balaji headlining. We've got Sriram, Munib, 
Matt Hogan of Bitwise, Jan Van Eck. This one's going to be a blast, guys. And I saw many of you out in London for a DAS this year, and I hope to see you out in Salt Lake for permissionless. And because y'all are such faithful listeners, you've got, if you use code MARGIN10, you're going to get 10% off your tickets. Appreciate you all. Hope to see you out there. If people in this room heard about that analogy of, you know, seven blind men touching an elephant and someone touches the trunk and someone touches the legs and someone touches the body and everyone describes a different thing. You know, to your point, Danny, about this asset class having multiple different characteristics and wearing multiple faces, sort of feel like that's really applicable to crypto for the most part. Um, but I want to give, I want to give people this, um, uh, lens or framework of looking at these things as commodities, uh, for the most part. And, you know, one question that I would have is one of the struggles, I think, for crypto writ large is people don't know how to value it, right? They look at it and it's like, doesn't have any cash flows, right? This is the Paul Tudor Jones, the barbarous relics comment that he makes about Bitcoin and gold. So does it make it easier for the two of you to look at these things as commodities? Cause commodities don't have cash flows either. Like what do valuation models or, you know, how do you make, commodity trades or investments is that helpful lens to look at these things i think i think it's been a bit of a mistake that you know investors have looked at like well you know what is it that i'm that i'm you know am i buying something to use or am i replacing the money that i have now is it an alternative form of barter which i think makes more sense for bitcoin um and you know with with ethereum now you know deflationary earning yields also for ethereum and then you know the technology assets are, are, are I think separate, but you know as a commodity, I think that you know it makes sense that that you're replacing a, an instrument of barter. You're not trying to buy an equity. Yeah, and I I think you know going back to my very early conversation with Wences, um, you know the upshot of that conversation was money is purely a trust instrument. It is a it is a trust construct. That's it. Now it may need a bunch of characteristics that go with it to make it a good trust medium um, but that's all it is and and then when you think about and I've had some very bizarre conversations with you know crypto hating central bankers over the years and you hear things like you know the dollar represents US GDP and the might of the military and some allocation of gold is all rubbish and um, it doesn't represent any of that it represents a trust system and but usually the strength of a currency goes hand in hand, you know, with the might of the issuing nation. Uh, so Bitcoin in a way, you know, if Bitcoin, you were to look at Bitcoin and say, what is the jurisdiction? It is the internet. What better jurisdiction could you possibly want? And that, to me, that trumps America, trumps China, trumps Japan. Um, and I think um, if it continues to grow in terms of its acceptance as a trust instrument, um, it, it will be a trust instrument with a very big, a very big following. And then, you know, the, co- the constant fiscal easing that we're seeing is eroding at that trust. Um, I think it's quite likely that the next, the next US president will ask for Congress to change the inflation forecast, which is a total betrayal of savers. Um, it's, you know, it couldn't be clearer that what, what, what you know, mm-hmm. you've got, you know, the, the numerator and the denominator are moving in opposite directions. Um, you know, from a, you know, from a, from a, from a money fundamentals perspective. Do you find that likely? I want to dig into that comment a little bit because you know, we're sort of talking at this interesting moment in time where we obviously had rampant inflation 2021, 2022. That's down to something like uh, three and a half or four percent in the US. But we're even just in the last couple of months, we're getting early signs. There's a really hot PPI report that just came in, in the last couple of weeks. Um, I think there were six or seven rate hike or rate cuts that were priced in by the market earlier this year that's been uh, pushed out to three. I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think there's a chance that inflation kind of takes back off from here? And would the Fed really actually change its target of 2%? Is that a likely outcome? I think they'll probably change it to, I think there's a good chance next year it gets changed to a, to an, a range, which would probably be two to two and a half, maybe. But if you look at what they're, they've never really been in a hurry to get it back to 2%. They've said, you know, we're looking to get it back to 2% by like the end of 2025. So what does that mean? Does that mean they're, I mean, it's, it's a pretty flexible target if they can spend that amount of time doing it. Um, but I mean, but the whole thing's a bit ridiculous anyway, you know, me- measured inflation versus real inflation is, is different. And, but, but I think the Fed is quite confident that the shelter component is, you know, is, is what's keeping inflation high. So, Provided that that cooperates over the next six to nine months, then 
you know, inflation may, may well be back there. And I mean, all the advances that we're seeing in productivity and AI are all defla- long-term deflationary as well. So, you know, th- th- there's like short-term bumps, I think, in, in, in the inflationary outlook, but, you know, long-term, I think technology and demographics are, are, are pretty deflationary drivers. And I think the Fed know that. So. Yeah. The only, the only thing I think has been a really slow and sort of insipid progress over the progression over the last sort of two or three decades has been, and certainly when I started in financial markets, the separation of church and state, you know, the independence of a financial, of a central bank versus whatever political party happened to be in power was very strong. That is no longer the case. It is quite clear now that if you have a financial crisis, if you have a real estate crisis, if you have a COVID crisis, the answer is print money and the politicians won't take no for an answer. And I, I fear, and certainly, you know, we know what Trump would do with this. We probably is going to see the same thing with a, uh, a Labour government in the UK, you know, very shortly. Um, there is, uh, there is no fear about printing money at all because while they've bent the system from time to time, they haven't yet broken it. Um, you know, it's possible they will continue to do it until they do. And I think, you know, to go back to your point, Danny, about money being a system of trust. Isn't the problem really with breaking that firewall that used to exist between these two important parts of the government is it's eroding a sense of trust more than anything else, right? Well, you know, we've seen, we've seen elements of this before. Um, there used to be, you know, a separation of investment banks and commercial banks, uh, in the United States, which was extremely strong. And, uh, you know, no sooner was that rescinded. And I was actually at JP Morgan when it was rescinded. Um, you know, the financial crisis and the weapons of mass destruction and financial mass destruction were not far behind. So, you know, we're all into free markets. That's great. But, but sometimes, you know, there are lines which probably shouldn't be crossed and, and certainly strong political influence on what happens, uh, in terms of currency issuance is, is, is a dangerous one. You know, it, it, I think as well, what one of the, one of the mistakes that investors have made, um, is being too Fed centric in the last, in the last year. Cause, you know, the Fed have been very loud about inflation targeting, you know, rates are optically, you know, high, um, versus, you know, versus the, the, the last 10 years. But, you know, what, what's been happening kind of much more quietly is fiscal easing in, in, in the US, you know, fiscal easing globally, monetary easing in Japan monetary using in China and all of these factors, you know, we live in, you know, a much more globalized world now. So assets like, you know, the S and P Bitcoin commodity markets, you know, have, ha- do have a global reach now. So I think that's, I think that's why there's been sort of some confusion as to why assets are rallying so much when the fed has been, you know, pr- pretty, pretty restrictive, but, you know, we're coming to the end of that. I mean, Okay, to, you know, to the Feds tonight, and there's a huge amount of you know discussion over whether the dots are going to say two two cuts or three cuts. Um, but the reality is, you know, Powell was very clear two weeks ago at Humphrey Hawkins that you know the next move is going to be lower, and and they believe you know you know real rates have been rising, RRP has been falling. So by standing still on QT and and monetary policy that they're actually net tightening anyway. And I think they know that. So, so you know, the, the next move is certainly, in, you know, in the right direction for asset prices. Does it feel like they're a little bit boxed in though? Because at the same, they've got inflation that looks like it's rearing back up. And at some point, right, there's, there's always two camps on this issue that they seem to talk past each other. And maybe it's an issue of just timelines. But there's this camp that says, so this, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, office in the U.S., projects $2 trillion deficits per year running out the next 10 years. And if you've looked at their estimates historically, they're always on the low side. (laughs) It's always, it's like a contractor in your house. It's always about twice as bad as you (laughs) want or hope it will be. Um, So that's the most conservative estimate that we're getting. Um, And to fight inflation, of course, we need to hike rates and that's only going to make the debt burden that much worse. So, I mean, there's always the camp that says the dollar is the dollar. It's not going away. They can just print money. It's not an issue. Government financing isn't like home financing. And then there's this other group, which looks very at a very long sort of arc of history and says, "Ah, this actually ends up becoming a problem for governments um, over a long span of time. Which camp do the two of you fall into there? 
Yeah. I, I've always tried to resist being sort of a doomsday type of, of person. Um, um, but I think it was Buffett that said, you know, when you go bankrupt, it's slowly, 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 and then all of a sudden. Um, you know, I've certainly seen many instances, you know, macro and, and micro of systems kind of breaking down, breaking out, you know, collapsing or, 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 or melting up even. Um, and it's, it's pretty scary. I think I, I really do. I just, you know, I don't know how long, uh, I, I mean, it sort of makes me question what debt really is. If you can just keep generating it. And you know, I think it's now a trillion every hundred days in America. Um, it's, it's a mystery to me. It, 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 it won't be, it won't be hard to explain if there's a problem after there's a problem. Um, it will look pretty obvious, but what the actual catalyst for that is, uh, is, is hard to say. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, you know, the revolution should be coming from those that are being inflated against, right? You know, the, what, you know, one of the trends that I think central bankers and politicians are probably intentionally asked as little about as possible, but it's surprising to me nonetheless that it's not asked more is just how rapidly wealth and in, wealth inequality is, is changing. Um, so I feel like that's kind of probably the fault line that, that, that will come to focus most quickly where, you know, people are, are, are aware that, that the policies are, you know, re really, really benefiting the, the few. And the other possible fault line, obviously, you know, we're, we're heading, you know, in the next six months in, into what will be one of the most contentious elections in America of all time. The rhetoric is already scary. Um, you know, we have a backdrop of basically two wars going on simultaneously as mm -hmm. this election comes to pass. It's, it's a, it's a very, um, perilous environment, I think. Um, and if anything, you know, if anything, you know, the, the so-called insurrection that happened at the, at the, at the results of the last election, um, there wasn't much rhetoric about that beforehand. And, and now there seems to be almost a, you know, a line in the sand, you know, Trump has said some pretty crazy things. Um, and I don't think the tone of that conversation is going to get any better between now and the election. So, you know, oftentimes when systems have a, a serious break like this, there is a catalyst and, and that's one that, uh, it'll be a relief to get through that election without it causing a problem, I think. But we, we have Solana meme coins to trade now, so it's okay. <laughs> It'll make the election Did any much more fun. Silver lining to every cloud. <laughs> Did any speakers yet not mention Solana meme coins? I don't think so. No. <laughs> At an institutional conference, no less. We're batting, batting a thousand here on Solana meme coins. Um, well, I think, you know, I, I think I would bring again all of this back to trust. That's what this really is, at least from my perspective. And it feels like, the reason why there's this general pall or like feeling of upsetness is I feel like a lot of people think that they've been betrayed in mm -hmm. some way, shape or form. That could be if you're a saver, right? And you're getting eaten away by inflation. Um, I think one that's a little bit tougher to pin down is the well, the income inequality or the wealth inequality, which every time the government steps in, it inherently favors one group instead of another. Um, we were talking a little bit, I think on the prep call for this about uh, the U.S. seizing Russian assets um, as well, which was a massive betrayal of trust. And regardless of whatever your political leanings are on that today, you know, the world is global, ultimately. And uh, if sovereigns don't feel like they're in control of their own assets, that's got to have implications down the road, don't you think? I think that's, you know, in the, in the same flavor as the things I, I just mentioned. And that wasn't just America. You know, it was a lot of places that uh, that did that. And um yeah, you could you could even say you know something. I'm not taking any political side on this necessarily, but the the legal persecution that Trump is facing right now, you know, is absolutely clearly politically motivated in many cases, not all, but many cases. So there's a lot of lines being crossed, um, and and um, and it all adds to this this kind of nervousness and, and apprehension, I think, in the markets. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, one question that I'd love to, to ask the two of you is maybe to knit everything that we're talking about here together is, you know, we started by talking, started out by talking about looking at, uh, digital assets as commodities and linking this idea of commodities and money. And I think maybe the link between commodities and money, why they're different, but they feel similar is the trust element of commodities is that you can't print more. <laughs> There's only so much you can take out of the ground in most cases. Um, and, it feels like we've been betrayed a little bit in various elements of trust mm -hmm. in the current fiat system. Um, and so one thing I'd love to get the two of your perspective on is, you know, going all the way back to the past of crypto and Bitcoin is Bitcoin was supposed to be this cash, this peer to peer 
digital electronic system of cash. Um, and now we're all very excited about Bitcoin ETFs. And there's this idea of Bitcoin as a store of value, gold, not about as cash. But what do you think the long term prognosis is? Like, do we actually have a chance to move to something like a digital money that people use? I mean, how do you see all of this, these questions that we're asking playing out in the long term? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think we, we, were, we were joking about it on the, on the prep call, I think, that, you know, the, the real the real revolutionary moment is, you know, when people don't think about, you know, oh, okay, am I, am I, am I, am I going to put 25 basis points, 1%, 5% into Bitcoin as a, you know, kind of wingy part of my portfolio that hedges against, I don't know, geopolitics, hyperinflation, whatever it might be, FOMO, <laughs> um, uh, you know, to when people think, well, actually, Bitcoin is a more elegant solution to money than the US dollar or the, Great British peso, peso, or you know, all, all, all of these fiat. You just say Great British peso. Yeah, all, <laughs> all <laughs> Is of, that bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah. All, you know, all, 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 all these, you know, you know, the the the, the these, you know, the the, the fiat Ponzi schemes yeah. are replaced by the, you know, by the, you know, the Bitcoin Ponzi scheme, and you know that that seems to be. What do they say? You know, the democracies, the the best of the worst solutions or something, you know, I mean. I, I don't see why not. I mean, I think the fundamental problem that, that Bitcoin has as a money right now is it's not valuable enough. Um, now, you take care of that, uh, and as you take care of that, also, you know, there's a lot of development obviously going on, let's just broadly call it L2 Bitcoin, and I think a lot of that's quite promising, actually. Um, it would make sense, I think. I, I mean, I, I know Ethereum is, you know, trying to make a run at being a little bit more of a monetary asset, but uh, and it's probably more functionally suited to, to being so, um, maybe not economically suited to being so, but functionally. And, um, and Bitcoin's kind of the other way around, but the work going on in Bitcoin, I think will go a long way to, to, to make that happen once the asset is of a much greater quantum. And what one really important thing as well that the ETFs have done is, you know, for, for high net worth and institutional investors is you can now, you know, you can borrow against the, Bitcoin ETFs, which you didn't used to, well, I mean, you could borrow against Bitcoin, but it was pretty, pretty complicated to do. But now, you know, you can hold IBIT in your Goldman Sachs PWM or prime, you know, prime brokerage account and it just gets, you know, slopped in with all the other assets that you, that you borrow against. So how do you think the current system, the incumbents would react to an actual bona fide transition to using these commodity monies that we're talking about, Bitcoin or Ethereum, as actual money. Um, and I think Danny, you and I, when we caught up the other night, we were talking about um, there are there are certainly some great uh, policymakers and members of the media who've done a great job. We've had many of them here at this conference today. But man, we've met with some resistance <laughs> as well. Um, it hasn't always been the best coverage or I think the most fair reception for the last uh, 10 years uh, in counting. I mean, how much of this is lack of understanding versus how much of this is incumbents recognizing a challenger? Oh, we could go down a rabbit hole here for sure. Um, look, I, I think the really big picture is, you know, I mean, one, one, one thought I have in my mind is that Bitcoin will be here in a thousand years and the European Central Bank won't be. Um, and, and, and I could give you a whole bunch of other thoughts like that. Um, I have a very, you know, a long, long-term view, way past my lifespan, I think, um, as to what will happen with Bitcoin. And what's clear to me is the the resistance, the lack of knowledge, the bias, the jealousy, if you like, is subsiding slowly with time, um, but will not in the short term disappear at all. Um, I've had, you know, some very interesting meetings over the years, particularly with much older, very high net worth, ultra high net worth people who are getting their first introduction to Bitcoin. And their first reaction is, wait a second, I've worked really hard. I'm rich. I've got this money. And now you're telling me there's another kind of money I don't have. They don't like that. And, and that goes all the way to top of guys like Augustine Carstens from the, you know, the head of the, the uh, uh, Bank of International Settlements and all these old guys, right? Who think that way. And, um, but, but I simultaneously, you know, in any institution I interact with, there's a bunch of 25 and 30 year olds. There is no, there is no resistance to crypto whatsoever from that age demographic anywhere. So you wait 20 years and then that's gone. 
you know, I mean, asked another way, what is it that the incumbents would like about Bitcoin? I mean, it's just, it's, it's a clear threat. Yeah. You know, there are obvious, there are th obvious things you can point at to make it sound bad. It's, it's as simple as that. So do you think it's just, I mean, you know, both of you have been around this industry for a long time, seen it in various stages of um, institutional adoption, where today we've got ETFs where Danny was wearing it to some unknown Chinese entity <laughs> to buy your <laughs> Bitcoin in the early days. I mean, we also, one thing that at least I'm conscious of is we've heard this before, right? Now, we've never had BlackRock, we've never had ETFs, um, but we have heard at various points the institutions were coming. I vividly remember when I got started in 2017 and I was at a bar and I heard Mike Novogratz say pensions were five months away. <laughs> yeah. They were not. So I guess I'm always take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt and would love both of your color about what is it actually, what is actually the appetite and the buy in in some of these larger, slow moving institutions? Well, there is absolutely no, I mean, I, I take your point on this. Look, we, we at CoinShares target 500 institutions, mostly around Europe on a very active basis and have been doing so for a number of years. We have a kind of a traffic light system where we, you know, stage one, you never heard of Bitcoin, you slam down the phone when we speak to you. Stage five is intention to buy. And we obviously try and migrate people up that chain as we go forward. That chain is moving, no question about it. Um, you've got to split the European, the EEA, if you like, into two areas. The, the FCA has done an incredibly good job of scaring the hell out of any institutional investors to get their clients involved. Mm. This most recent ETN announcement is better than nothing, but it still comes with an implication that if there are retail people below your professional investor, you know, we're going to look through and it's not good. On the other hand, Europe is getting super interesting. Um, I've done a lot of traveling in Europe recently, and my sense is that Financial institutions. I was with uh, Bank B, uh, B, uh, B, 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 M, H Bank, I think it is. It's the second largest bank in Hungary. They are state owned. They're a big entity, big institution, millions of customers. And they're waiting for the middle of the year so that they can, you know, they're, they're going to have their regulatory framework with MICA. They want to be involved. You know, there's, it's not like, oh my God, those guys again, you know, which we've heard <laughs> in the past. So, so they are coming. I, I wouldn't have agreed with Novo when he said that many years ago because I heard that too. But um, I'm trying to dag, drag my guys <laughs> here. <laughs> Just um, an example. But, but yeah, I mean, it's been a long time coming. It's required uh, this this framework to be in place. The U.S. is going a very different way. They're suing their way into the future, both you know up and down. Um, but in Europe, it's happening. So th there's th this is sort of what I was saying before about the GSCI and commodities. That's how that sea change is manifest. Uh, and it is, it is an active desire to be engaged. And it's not a FOMO. It's just like, oh, finally, there's not, we don't have to think gray area. We can think clear area. And, uh, that's going to make a huge difference. Yeah. I mean, I, so, I mean, I got into crypto in, in 2016. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk when in the first bull market in, you know, 2017, 2018 about the herd coming. I don't really think it was happening then. Um, you know, people, showed interest saw there to be some speculative opportunities but i i don't think it was really happening then i think the bull in 2020 with the money printing that came out of covid people spending much more time online people spending much more time trading online i feel like that's when the institutions really started to dig in and do the work and i think it's been a three-year process where you know as sort of scary as you know the 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 blow up was well we had you know we had an interest rate tightening cycle which affected all assets then we had a credit crisis in crypto but i don't think either of those things stopped institutions doing the work that they started in 2020 2021 and i think we're now finally seeing a, a place where they're happy with the rails that exist they're happy they're happier with the regulatory framework and at least the direction that that's going. So uh, th this feels, you know, 20, 2017 was like a one out of 10. Uh, 2020 was like a three out of 10. And I think we're now at like a seven out of 10 in terms of how engaged, you know, institutional. I would, I would say that's a, that's a good assessment. Mm -hmm. So I know we're, we're in our closing minutes here and we've talked about some relatively serious, maybe <laughs> dire sounding uh, topics. I want to end with um, maybe a positive or 
uh, you know, observation or something that makes both of you feel really optimistic or hopeful about the future could include crypto, could not. <laughs> um, you didn't ask that in the prep call, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot here. I've already said Solana meme coins. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Geoboard. Look, I, I, I'll give you one. I mean, and, uh, and this is a very personal story, really, which is, um, you know, there were some pretty dark days in crypto. Um, I mean, we, we, we started this enterprise in 2012, as I said, and I don't think we actually generated a dollar in revenue of any kind for two years. And I don't think we became profitable for four years. Um, and uh, I do remember my personal accountant tapping me on the shoulder at one point and going, you really need to stop doing this. Um, and it was really tough. And I think, to be honest, you know, my stubbornness got the better of me, thankfully, uh, <laughs> which is why we're sitting here today. Um, but, you know, the gift for me and that what inspires me is, and I continue to believe this, is sort of Bitcoin taught me about myself. Um, and that that's a gift. Love that. Yeah. I mean, I... You know, I just, I, I think it's, it's a positive evolution in, 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 in form, in, in the form of money. This is what, you know, and, and it's a way, it's a trustless system. And these two fundamental things were what first attracted me about two crypto and two, well, just Bitcoin really in, in, in 2016. And I think that's what gets most people into it. Uh, it was a pretty shitty feeling at, you know, at least three occasions when it felt like maybe I got that wrong. Um, and I think it's, you know, it, it, it does feel good to, to know that, you know, it, it, it's kind of a shared view of many, many people. And the reason that we're getting it right is that more and more people agree. Those are good words to end it on. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Give them a warm round of applause, everyone. 